I'm Michael Fox, and this is the Prospector News Podcast. And I have joining me a good friend and CEO of Backtech Environmental, Ross Orr. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Thanks, Michael. Always good to chat. As uh, we always do, uh, before we get into the meat and potatoes of uh, today's conversation, uh, let's give uh, people that aren't familiar with BackTech uh, a quick uh, 10,000 po- you know, foot view of uh, what the company is and what you're doing. Okay, thanks. Um, well, BackTech um, owns proprietary bioleaching technology. We've owned it for years. Um, and what we do is we chase arsenic. Uh, in association with gold because everybody else runs away from it. And we found a project in a potential project in southwestern Ecuador where the arsenic is sky high compared, you know, in the concentrates. And so it's in need of uh, some sort of a domestic processing technology as opposed to shipping half the value across to China to the smelters and roasters who no doubt burn it illegally. So bioleaching is a is a, an ESG technology. Um, we you know, process high, high arsenic concentrates and we stabilize the arsenic as a byproduct and then produce the gold for sale uh, as a dory. Wonderful. Um, but today's conversation isn't going to be about uh, arsenic gold. Um, you guys have just had a game-changing patent awarded to you. Um, and we're going to go into uh, the nickel camps of Sudbury and we're going to talk about pyrotite. Uh, instead of arsenic gold, so let's uh, let's start off about uh, what the patent is and uh, that's just been granted to you guys. So, it, first of all, if the patent wasn't granted, it's an application for for it's a, like a preliminary patent. We have twelve months to prove what we said we can do, and what we said we could do is we can bio leach pyrotite and pyrite for that matter to to dump um, all the various components of those two particular sulfides into solution, and then selectively extract that um, each, each individual element for sale. So the difference is, when we originally filed the patent uh, last year, we talked about producing an iron hydroxide that would then go undergo some sort of a hydrogen reduction process to make pellets. What we announced uh, the other day or yesterday was that we are now going to eliminate the second step and try to electrowind iron directly from the solution. So you'd be producing a pure iron that could then be shipped directly off to steel makers or battery makers or the like. But also because of, there's a lot of sulfur in the, uh, in the liquid, the, uh, dissolved sulfur, with, with the addition of ammonia, we can produce uh, an organic fertilizer uh, for a market that's about $6 billion a year. It's very similar to what Sherrod does in Cuba with their uh, sulfide. Um, pr- production. They, they also produce an organic fertilizer. And then finally, you, you precipitate out your uh, your base metals, your copper, nickel, and cobalt that are there. There's relatively low grade, but, but they're still recoverable. Uh, there's a little bit of magnetite that you use uh, magnetics on to remove. And finally, the small amount of silicates that are left can be you know, baked into geopolymers or maybe used as a paste backfill for underground mines. But the essence, in essence, taking one ton of waste and producing zero waste. Incredible, really. Uh, that's that's remarkable. Uh, when you and I first uh, got face to face, it was at a, a con- actually it was probably the first conference after the pandemic. It was in Chicago, and we were discussing this just in generalities in advance to the work that you guys were planning to do, and. We did a back a napkin kind of calculation on how many tons of pyrotite waste there was just in the Sudbury region alone. And it was like in the billions of tons, if I remember correctly. Um, that's a bit aggressive. <laughs> uh, what, we, what we know uh, from Valet and Glencore that the mess that they're responsible for is somewhere between 80 and 100 million tons of puritite tailings. There are, there are other tailings, of course, um, that would result from the flotation process that would probably be more pyrite or pentlandite. But any, any place that has iron, this, this technology could potentially work. So if you're, if you're 
applying to build a mine in Ecuador, say, and you know you're having problems with the the locals, you know, one of the things you can now hopefully you can say is, look, there's no iron going into the tailings, so you don't have to worry about long-term acid, you know, acid generating issues. And not only that, but we're going to make money off this because we're going to turn around and sell this this uh, iron to uh, an ever increasing market. I mean, with the the advent of batteries for cars, and there's a lot of iron in them. And of course, on the steel side, there's a lot of uh, a lot of consumption of iron as well. So, um, you know, the timing is right for it. And, and uh, uh, you talk about a circular economy. This this is the epitome of it, really. Yeah. No. Definitely. Now, um, most people that aren't geologists have no concept of what pyrotite itself is. Can we we talk? Have a little bit of a talk so people can understand it, where it comes from how it has sure. to be dealt with currently, and it's uh, the dangerous nature that it has uh, as a tailings waste. Yeah, absolutely. So pure type is basically made up of about 60% iron, 30% sulfur, and then it's got the copper, nickel, cobalts, and as I mentioned before, some magnetite and some... Anyways, uh, the, the value, though, we, we always thought the value of this, this material was going to be from the nickel and the cobalt. But as it turns out, there's a much bigger animal here in the, in the iron production and the, and the fertilizer production. So there's, there's two types of, of uh, sulfides in the Sudbury Basin. There's pentlandite, which tends to be a much higher grade. And there's pyrotite, which is about 0.85% on average, which is really not bad considering I've seen some people touting 0.25 in drill holes. So, so at the end of the day, though, pyrotite aggressively tries to oxidize itself. And if you leave it just lying out on the, on the ground, it'll start to smolder. It'll, you know, it's, trying, it's working so hard and so fast to oxidize that it literally it generates heat. So what they did in the past was they either buried it under about three feet of, of dirt to, to starve the oxygen, or they put it in lakes underwater, so again, so that oxygen couldn't get at it. What they're finding, of course, is over the years that there's bacteria in the water that actually do like this stuff, and so they've been nibbling away at this uh, this material, and of course, generating acid as a byproduct of it. So, the, for us, the the bio leaching of the puritite, which is something we actually did 25 years ago down in Australia, uh, only to find that we created this soup of of, of a mess, and we. We didn't have the technology to properly separate all these different elements. Um, the, the advent of using electroweighting, though, which has been around for you know 175 years, um, is, is new because we're marrying bio leaching to electroweighting, which is, I think, as far as we know, it's, it's never been done before, and um, it's 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 very exciting. I mean, I mean, I don't like using the B word, but I mean, this is a very very uh, large patent if, if it's accepted and granted and we can deliver the mail. And by the way, if we if we cannot electroweight it for whatever reason, because maybe there's too much sulfur contamination, then we go back to plan B, which which is again you know precipitating out this this iron hydroxide that would then be pelletized for sale to the uh, steel industry. So either way you have a plan A and plan B that you'll clean up these tailings and and leave it waste free. Yeah, yeah, and again, th this this could be applied to mines that are in production today as well, because they can go back and start to reprocess the tailings and produce iron, and 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 a, and a sulfide uh, fertilizer. So it's it's quite something. I mean, it's uh, Paul Miller, who's the architect behind the whole thing, Dr. Paul Miller, um, is uh, visibly excited about this, um, which is rare. Yeah, you only get scientists excited when they have a eureka moment. So this this sounds like one of those moments. Yeah. But, you know, it works on paper. We just have to prove it works in the lab now or, or in, a, in a test facility. So we'll probably bio, you know, begin the bioleaching process very quickly. That Natty is Dr. Natty Mikachek's plant up in his Sudbury. And then that pregnant liquor then will then go off to uh, to groups that, that do electroweighting, that do this sort of reduction for for sulfur, um, and I just think all we're missing right now is money, but that seems to be our common theme in everything we do. <laughs> yeah, money makes the world go round, unfortunately, yeah, but uh, I would think you should have some ESG funds taking a look, hard look at this because um, there is significant liabilities on 
various companies books throughout different nickel belts uh, for old pyrotite uh, tailings waste that are, are sitting there basically leaching acid into the environment. Yeah, and you've got, you know, Voises Bay, pyrotite, 60% pyrotite. You've got Thompson, Lynn Lake, Manitoba, and those are just pyrotite spots. And of course, they're also in Australia, they're, they're everywhere, you know, and it's, it's stuff that nobody wants to deal with. So we'll deal with it. It's, it's like the arsenic issue. Everybody runs away from arsenic. We run to it because we know that there's a big market there. And, you know, getting that first plant up and running in Ecuador, I've said this many times, is, is sort of the, it's, a, it's the first domino that's been glued. And we keep whacking away at it, and, and it's about to topple. And when it does, um, you know, you're going to have plants. I think there's, there's room for two plants in Peru. There's a plant in Colombia. That's just in the next five years. And collectively, you know, those plants could produce somewhere between, you know, 350 and 400,000 ounces of gold a year, collectively. That's a billion dollars in revenue at today's prices. Yeah, and that's just on the gold side of the business. That's just on the gold side. So one of the things we've got to consider on, as we look at this is, you know, how do we how do we finance the R and D side? Is it done in a in a separate company? Is it is it dropped down to a subsidiary? Is it spun off to the shareholders? I guess that that's going to be determined by whoever expressed an interest in in getting involved with us on this. I mean, who? I mean, they're the big the big mining companies should be looking at this very closely. Yeah, now, the, your partner in Sudbury, they have a, a strong relationship with Valley down there uh, and with an eye towards cleaning up the tailings liability there. Well, that, that's the consortium that we're, on, we're part of. Yeah. Um, and we're, I guess we're the bioleaching component. Uh, Metso is there as well. So, um, yeah. You know, the idea is, I mean, don't forget Valley had a bit of a problem in Brazil a few years ago, and, and I think they're hypersensitive towards anything related to tailings for, for obvious reasons, and, and any, any company would be. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, hopefully they say, this is great, let's put it to work. Yeah, no, definitely. Whenever you hear ESG complaints on a, on a mining company, almost... Uh, Almost every time it goes down to the tailings and the tailings process and and what's left over from uh, after they get the ore and how that's going to end up getting remediated. So this this is groundbreaking stuff. Um, is Valley as excited as your scientists? Do they realize this is a uh, a eureka moment? I believe she's meeting with them today. Okay, so, <laughs> so I'm I'm not putting any words in Valley's mouth because I don't know what their feelings are. Okay, well, I guess we'll find out soon if uh, you know if we hear a shout of Eureka coming from the Sudbury area, we know what uh, we know what precipitated it today. Um, future steps now. You've got the the temporary patent. You have to prove that it works. Um, what's the process for doing that, and uh, uh, how long, and uh, where is that going to take place? Well, the first thing we're going to do is identify a downstream partner who can who can do the necessary test work that has to be done on this pregnant liquor that we're going to be producing at, at Nadia's uh, plant at Mararco. So I, I, I would think the bioleaching will, will start very shortly, like like later this month, I think, which isn't that far away. Um, and again, to, to, to get this material where everything goes into solution is, is relatively easy because it's actually helping you try to oxidize itself. So we're just going to just speed up and, and dump everything into solution. Uh, that solution then goes off site to somebody that, who can do the electro who can do the sulfur, uh, you know, the, the production of the um, salt, the uh, fertilizer, et cetera. So everything, hopefully, we can find somebody in one house that can do everything. And if anybody is in that business out there listening, let, let me know. <laughs> um, I mean, this, this just we're just waiting for the dust to settle right now from you know, we traded a million shares yesterday on the back of the news, so somebody gets it, um, and somebody doesn't, obviously. So, um, on the other side of the coin in Ecuador, you know, we're at various stages with different groups of discussion. Uh, you know, the debt side always takes a lot longer because you're going to be living with these people for five to six years. It's not like equity where they can turn around and sell it after four months and move on to the, 
to their next investment. So they've got to be very comfortable that, you know, um, you know, that we can do what we say we can do. Our biggest issue, of course, is that we don't have a mine. We don't have a deposit that has, you know, even 50,000 ounces of gold sitting there that gives you, gives you a backup so that maybe the royalty companies or the streamers could look at you. Nobody wants to buy a leach plant because they wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, so that's sort of the biggest hurdle that we're, we're trying to get over right now. And we're getting all sorts of different pitches for, you know, direct equity and back tech, direct equity in the project, uh, equity and debt. Uh, we just have to make sure we pick the best deal. Yeah, no, definitely. It's uh, when the finish line is that close, it's uh, not a question that you're going to cross the finish line. It's just a question of when. I wrote a piece a few weeks ago on my Sunday morning coffee on the definition of the word unbelievable. Um, I, we did our feasibility study at $1,600 gold, and today we're trading around $2,350. For every uh, $100 increase in the price of or the value of gold, it increases our profit by $1 million US. So technically, the $10.7 million that we were making at $1,600, well, do the math. You're adding literally $800, $8 million you know, to, to that bottom line. And don't forget, we're non-taxable for 12 years. Um, our CapEx is 17 and our anticipated profit is 18. And people say, that's unbelievable, or I don't believe it. <laughs> so, so we're kind of stuck in the middle of those that, you know, love it and those that are skeptical of what we're saying. Well, uh, you know, as a lot of people would uh, say, although this is pretty heavily de-risked, um, the bigger the risk, the bigger the return on it. So for those that, you know, think it's unbelievable, you know, every once in a while you have to swing for the fences, so. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And, you know, this, it's not our first rodeo. We've built these things before. It's not like it's a brand new technology. The only thing that's different is, is that instead of making money for the mining companies by building a plant beside their mine, we're doing it for ourselves. And for some reason that seems to, put you back to the starting line again as far as credibility I, I don't understand why but it's their money you know so you have to sort of uh you have to dance to their tune yeah well it's the golden rule ross uh hugh has the gold makes the rules unfortunately yeah exactly uh this is a very good catch-up uh, I am so excited to see how everything progresses in Sudbury. I truly believe that this is not only for the company, but for the environment. And the fact that this is going to be Canadian technology, let me wrap myself in our nation's flag, um, a game changer across the board on so many levels. And I look forward to uh, seeing how this uh, rolls out and progresses over the next year. And um, and seeing you make this uh, patent permanent. Yep, that's what we're gonna try to do, ASAP. Wonderful, thanks very much for the, the uh, time for the update today, and I look forward to uh, chatting with you again very soon. Thanks, Michael. Backtech Environmental Corp is a paid sponsor of the Prospector News. The host owns shares, warrants, and royalties in Backtech Environmental, bought at the market for investment purposes. The Prospector News Podcast is for educational purposes only. The opinions expressed are those of the participants and are not to be taken as investment advice. Listeners need to do their own due diligence and seek advice of a licensed investment advisor.